Great. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, let's get started. I think people are still joining, but we are a minute past two. So um, let's begin and people can obviously continue to, to join. Um, so uh, firstly, welcome to uh, this webinar on what might a general election mean for uh, the crypto industry. Delighted to be joined by Gavin Shuka, who is uh, an advisory member here at Emergence Advisory, but is also a um, former member of parliament and uh, Labour member of parliament. So welcome, uh, Gavin. Um, so before we start, briefly, I'm Lewis. Uh, I'm a consultant here at Emergence Advisory. Um, my background is slightly more colourful than Gavin's. Um, I actually worked for both the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, albeit um, not at the same time. Uh, and uh, more recently for the um, Secretary of State for Defence, um, uh, Grant Chaps. So, and Gavin, if I may give you a brief introduction. So uh, Gavin was a Member of Parliament from uh, 2010 to 2019, I think. Gavin, if I'm just right. right in saying that. Um, a very quiet decade <laughs> in UK politics. Indeed, not much happened. Uh, but Gavin served in a number of front bench roles, um, including as Shadow Minister for the Environment and International Development, uh, also participating in the Labour Manifesto process. Uh, he chaired the... Uh, influential Labour and Cooperative Group of MPs, and also served as a Parliamentary Private Secretary uh, to the now London Mayor, Sadiq Khan, um, and also served on a number of Parliamentary Committees. So certainly a busy man whilst uh, you were in Westminster, uh, Gavin. Um, so obviously the topic, and we'll come to you in a minute, Gavin, uh, with some questions, but the topic of discussion for today is um, what a general election might mean for the, the UK crypto industry. Um, obviously, um, I think Labour is eyeing a return to power 13 years on from when it last held office. There's certainly a lot of speculation around when the next election might be. Um, and I think with that in mind, and obviously, you know, who might who might form that next government. But with that in mind, um, I think it's important to consider what that next potential government might do with crypto and uh, its approach to regulation. Um, as you know, the current government has set out its quite ambitious plans to regulate um, crypto and for the UK to be a global hub uh, for uh, crypto asset investment. And there's growing interest, particularly in how Labour might potentially treat crypto and ultimately whether a Labour government might have the same viewpoint as the current government when it comes to crypto. So I think some key things that we're looking to explore today and we um, have had a number of questions sent in to us in advance of this webinar which um, we will cover as we, we go through. But I think the main themes that we want to try and explore is the current political landscape uh, in Westminster in relation to crypto and digital assets, what the potential outcomes of any general election might be and what that might mean, and then also what industry can do to prepare for the outcome of the next general election. So just to start on that first big question, uh, Gavin, um, and this was one that we received a lot of questions on in advance, I do appreciate this might not be something you'll be able to answer, but um, when will the next general election take place? Um, and just to frame that, I think for industry in general, I think it's important to recognise that general elections can be quite an unsettling time for businesses. Um, it does bring uncertainty, um, not just in terms of what that next government might look like, but also in the run up to it um, with lots of speculation around what that might mean. So 
perhaps if we start there, I mean, what would what are your views and what are we seeing, at least at the moment, in terms of um, when a general election could be? Lewis, thanks. And um, before I answer that, let me just um, uh, get my thanks in up front. Thanks for inviting me. Um, obviously to speak today and um, obviously we focused in on my time in Westminster which finished in 2019 just for the um, purposes of people that are on this call it might be helpful to say a little bit around what I'm doing as the day job now because obviously I'm very proudly part of the advisory board at Emergence but um, that isn't my main job I'm actually a, a fintech uh, founder myself so um, I founded a business in 2020 called Cardio we use open banking to help uh, UK consumers manage their credit cards better and save money. And so um, a lot of the insight that I think um, I may be able to bring, they will obviously be rooted in a bit of political commentary, but beyond that, I'm really interested in trying to give um, really relevant information to the very skilled people we've got on this call who are um, uh, within the kind of uh, regulated world and trying to work out how best to move things forward. So um, thanks for letting me do that up front. When will the general election be? Well, I'm out of the predictions business, but let me just look out um, a few options. First of all, let's start with the um, what I would call the regulatory environment. So what is the regulatory environment for this? Um, it's um, actually a convention that was underpinned actually in the last 10 years by a piece of legislation called the Fixed Terms Parliament Act, um, which has now been uh, removed, which uh, says that a general election has to happen essentially every five years. Last election, of course, was December 2019. Um, that puts the latest date for a general election as January of 2025. I think that's right, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so uh, what are Richie Sunak's options? First thing, Richie Sunak can choose the date of the general election. He goes to the king, he asks for a dissolution of parliament, and therefore trying to answer this question really goes to the heart of the question what is in the best interests of Richie Sunak? You may have noticed there's quite a lot of commentary around this. Um, without kind of jumping too far ahead, um, I think the general Westminster consensus is that Labour remains strongest in terms of its possibility of winning the next election. And therefore, there are two kind of things at the forefront of Richie Sunak's mind when it comes to setting the date. The first one is what's in the best interests of the Conservative Party, which, by the way, may be if you think you're going to lose, you try and lose the fewest seats possible. There's one group of um, people within the Conservative Party that are pushing for an earlier election, maybe as early as May of next year. Um, and the logic being there, if the public want time for a change, um, actually dragging things out, slogging away as things get worse and worse, may result in a worse result. The other thing that's driving Richie Sunak is actually even for someone that probably would be quite content to go and put his feet up in uh, California and go and do some interesting startup investments, being prime minister is pretty cool, right? So you've got uh, the ability to wield a huge amount of power and influence. And what we've seen in recent weeks is some of the pet projects in which you've seen that has. He's been really keen to implement whether that's scrapping HS2, banning smoking as young people become older and so on. And he may make a gamble to say, I'm going to go as long as I possibly can. Um, the other reason why I think it may be as long as I possibly can is there is something innate in the makeup of politicians. Lewis will know this because he's worked with many of us in the past. And um, we always believe that something might turn up to save us from our fate. Um, this is the staying alive strategy. And um, what we've learned from previous administrations where uh, the governing party looks to be in a precarious position is that generally people tend to go long. That was the case, obviously, for Gordon Brown in 2005 to 2010 and the case for John Major in 1992 to 1997. I should add that in both of those scenarios, um, the incumbent prime minister lost. Great. Good. Uh that's that's really interesting. And I think, yes, so I think there's a, a lot of discussion, as you rightly say, just to capture that in terms of, OK, would they go sooner? Would they go later? That clearly doesn't help in terms of the instability that we were talking about before. 
Um, and so I guess for industry that is trying to at least plan to a degree around what this might ultimately mean and when it might happen, um, it sounds like actually maybe try and be prepared for something maybe in the short term, but also perhaps work on the basis of a the potential for a longer runway? I think that's right. And, you know, what would I say? I can't give you the date, but I know it's inevitable. And it will happen in the next 15 months. And therefore, I mean, we'll get onto this, hopefully, as we get a bit more practical as we go through the session. That isn't a long time, actually, to engage um, with this issue. It has the potential to obviously hugely disrupt the industry. Um, I know we'll go on and talk about some things that um, the different parties are saying, but um, whether it's May or it's October or it's January, I think we're heading towards a general election, which could be um, momentous in terms of change and therefore industry needs to prepare for it. Great, thank you. And actually, just before we move on to that, because I think you're on the cusp of talking about maybe even potentially about to offer a prediction in terms of where we might be in terms of who's potentially going to form the next government. Um, just want to share this quote from uh, Professor Michael Thrasher, who's an election analyst at Sky. Um, clearly, there's a lot of speculation around when this could happen, but um, for for them, uh, a contest in autumn 2024, late September, early October, is favourite, uh, again, apparently, on the basis of kind of what you alluded to there, Gavin, which is the Conservatives could seek to try and um, wait a bit longer in the hope that some of these uh, potential policies and, and key indicators improve over time. Um, so again, but again, I think, as you say, nobody knows. Yeah, don't trust anyone that tells you they've got the inside line. I bet Richie Sunak doesn't even know at this point. That's the important point. Yeah, interesting. Well, I think then just moving us on to, uh, and again, there's a theme here, Gavin, but we did have a lot of questions on who might win the next election. And this might potentially be something where we can give a bit more detail and maybe paint a bit more of a colourful um, picture. So before we jump in and before I actually put that question to you, Gavin, um, just wanted to show everybody uh, the latest polls. And obviously um, we'll talk about this, but um, feel free to disagree, Gavin, but I think it's clear that Labour have been consistently ahead in the polls versus the Conservatives for um, quite some time. They've also had some good success, let's say, in some of the recent tests, whether we're looking at you know, some of the recent by-elections, which uh, have been covered quite um, widely, and a lot of people kind of reading into that, um, what that says about Labour's prospects for a, for a general election. I might go as far as to say that it would appear on the basis of these polls, um, and this is just one, but actually there are a number of polls that are suggesting similar things, that Labour is perhaps closer than it has been in a long time to, uh, to forming a future government. I'm not sure um, what your thoughts on that would be. Um, but I think important to stress, ultimately, we don't know uh, who is likely to form the next government. I would say there's still a lot to play for, um, over, as you say, over that potentially 12 months. But um, on that question of, OK, who might form the next government, are there any indicators that we're seeing and what are your thoughts in terms of the direction of travel? Thanks, Liz. Um, well, first things first, just to be really clear, I don't have a party political affiliation, so I'm Absolutely not on the pitch. I'm in the stands trying to provide some commentary. Um, uh, but we on this call all love a bit of MI, right? We love the, the top level KPIs. And this is this is the best bit of information that we've got. What we've got here is a very high quality set of polls that are asked consistently. And let me just explain uh, what's, first of all, what's going on in terms of events. And secondly, link to that what the underlying kind of next layer of data that these party leaders will be looking at to try and determine 
their likelihood of winning. So first thing to say, you see the big kind of breakaway for Labour comes in two uh, parts. The first one is around January 2022. Now, I know the last few years have been pretty up and down, so most people will probably struggle to remember what they were doing in January 2022, um, let alone um, what was going on in government. But the big story is Partygate. So what we see is in January 2022, first set of stories start coming out about um, the uh, events that were going on in Downing Street um, in the Boris Johnson administration. And what we saw from that moment onwards was a kind of long, hard slog through to October as Boris Johnson tried to hold together uh, his party um, through a series of uh, scandals, some of which were related obviously to COVID and others um, are kind of well publicised. I think most people, if they have an interest in the markets, um, will understand what the second big breakaway there is. And that's in October of 2022. And that's the incoming Liz Trust quasi quieting uh, budget and period of instability are around about 50 days. Now, if I was the Conservative Party, what I would be uh, encouraged by is even though things spiked to the point where more than 50 percent, imagine that more than one in two people said that they would vote Labour in the aftermath of um, Liz Trust, uh, it's actually started to come back down a bit closer to the mean in the immediate aftermath. The thing that would really discourage me though, is the fact that if you look at it, that trend is pretty sustained. There is a gap uh, at the moment of between 20 and 25 points between Labour and the Conservatives. And therefore on any analysis, even judging for the fact that um, as we get closer to general elections, polls tend to close in, um, this is pretty unprecedented um, as a signal as to what's gonna go on. So let me just say this. I think the consensus view, the betting markets view, um, the common sense view would suggest that um, we've reached one of those points in British politics where as a whole people believe it's probably time for a change. It's not unusual after 13 years, 14 years of an administration. That was certainly the case um, in the last Labour administration. But let me just go one level below, which is to say what's driving that. Um, I think it's, it's really five factors. So I just made a quick note of this coming into the meeting. First one is on the measure of party leaders. Consistently now, uh, Keir Starmer continues to lead Richie Sunak in terms of who is seen by the public as the best leader. The so one in three say Starmer would make a better PM. That's compared to one in five for Richie Sunak. Secondly, uh, economic credibility. Now, this is an issue which traditionally the Labour Party has struggled on. It's never won an election um, uh, where it had not been at least um, tying with the Conservative Party on the measure of economic credibility. But I think, and frankly, largely off the back of events of this time last year, um, that what we're seeing is that Labour has closed that gap. So they are there or thereabouts with the Conservative Party and economic credibility. They lead consistently, though, on a basket of issues, though, on uh, healthcare where they lead 40% to 17. Cost of living, asylum and immigration, which has historically been seen as a more conservative or right-wing issue, housing and transport. Third factor, um, perhaps prevalent for this call, um, business support. The recent uh, poll last month said that more than, uh, so nearly half, 49% of C-suite business representatives now believe that Labour is the most in touch with the needs of businesses and employers. And that compares just uh, with a third uh, for Richie Sunak. The fourth thing is we don't just have to look at um, the polling data here. We can look at actual results. So when MPs um, are forced to step down or choose to resign, there's a by-election. So it's an out-of-sequence election um, year where not every seat is up for grabs, just selected ones. Um, there was a long string of Labour and Lib Dem victories um, over the Conservatives through this Parliament. Um, including actually in my neighbouring seat, I used to represent Luton South, the neighbouring seat was Nadine Dorries. Um, this was, you may have seen this a couple of weeks ago, um, overturning the largest uh, numeric uh, Tory majority since 1945. Um, and then fifthly, and I think this is a, an area which is underreported, um, so 
Um, you may be across this. Um, if you're not, um, please take notes and so you can sound knowledgeable when you talk to your friends around what you learned on this call. Um, Scotland. So um, what we've seen historically is that when the Labour Party wins, it wins while sweeping Scotland, where well, there's around 60 seats up for play. Um, the politics of Scotland obviously is very different um, to the rest of the country because the SNP are there. What we saw in 2015 is a com basically a complete wipeout of Labour north of the border. Um, so um, in this most recent parliament, um, only one Labour MP has been returned out of around 60. And that was Ian Murray, who came in uh, alongside me in 2010. The politics that have shifted up in Scotland, though, make it look right now that the number of seats returned by the SNP and by Labour would be neck and neck, 25 to 30 seats each. And that has a huge impact on the level of swing that is required um, in the rest of England, Wales, um, to get to a majority. Um, one estimate said that for every five seats that Labour wins, takes off the SNP in Scotland, the swing needs to be 1% lower. Um, and that, along with tactical voting, I think all points up to an argument to say that this is Keir Starmer's election to lose. Great, thank you, Gavin. That's really interesting. And I think, um, you know, for us political nerds, I don't mind admitting that that I unfortunately fall into that bracket. Um, I think that's, this can be quite an interesting topic. I mean, it, interesting that you mention business support. That's quite a high figure of business leaders who are saying that actually they are now actually view the Labour Party as a serious party of business. We know, and I think a lot of people on this call will have also seen a bit of a battle of late between particularly the Conservatives and Labour to try and position themselves as the party of business um, to a degree, maybe try and rebuild uh, business relations after things like Brexit and, you know, as you mentioned, Liz Truss and uh, the economic instability, let's say, that's, that followed from that. Um, I think as well, I mean, so funny you mentioned Nadine Dorries. Nadine Dorries was potentially the longest resignation uh, in history. Um, but these little snapshots into um, what's happening in terms of by-elections can be quite telling. I mean, would you agree, I suppose, whilst it's a useful snapshot, would you agree that it is a snapshot and actually some of these things may not necessarily be replicated when it comes to the general election and actually... Potentially, would we expect to see some of these polls narrow as we approach the election? Yeah, so so let me, having just laid out a very comprehensive answer, which kind of points towards Labour winning, uh, play devil's advocate for a moment and try and make the case for the opposition, uh, or in this case, the government. Um, if I were someone that thought there was an opportunity for the Conservatives to win, I would probably pin that on a series of beliefs. The first one being while Keir Starmer is, of course, um, uh, ahead in terms of party uh, leader polling at the moment and enjoying a very significant lead um, in the polls on party affiliation, I think it's fair to say that he's not sealed the deal in the same way that perhaps previous Labour leaders have done. Secondly, we know that polls can close up um, and often do. Um, actually, they tend to start closing up earlier than now, I would just add. But hey, um, every precedent is there um, to be shaken. Thirdly, it's not unusual for the incumbent party to lose by-elections. I think what we're seeing is pretty seismic in terms of the, the way in which they are being lost. And I think a big part of that is actually tactical voting. So when we last saw majorly in 1997, where individual voters, without being told, are sorting by constituency as to whether they should vote Lib Dem or SNP or Labour um, to uh, get out um, the Conservatives in their own localities. But I suppose lastly, it's the campaigns will make a difference. They'll matter. Um, as we saw in 2019, um, an election which was fought by one side on cost of living, um, public services, um, uh, the kind of foreign policy we want to have, all the rest, was completely demolished by a party that made it all about Brexit. 
So actually the framing of these arguments going in is going to be really key. And I would say that probably that's what is at the forefront of Richie Sunak's minds when he talks about his kind of long-term plans, mm. his um, kind of five key priorities. They're trying to start framing the next election as early as they possibly can on issues on which they want to fight, not the issues that the late party wants to fight and perhaps maybe the public. Yep, that makes perfect sense. And actually, before we move on to thinking about, okay, well, what could a Labour government, if indeed that is the direction of travel, at least as we see it now, what might their approach be as an administration towards uh, the crypto industry? Um, I just want to quickly show everybody um, a couple of quotes, which hopefully uh, summarises and aligns with what you've just touched on, uh, Gavin. So, um, you know, whilst it looks positive, I think it's safe to say what we're seeing at the moment is an indicator. And it does give us enough, I think, as people in the industry to uh, begin to plan on what that could mean. But clearly still a lot to play for. So. Uh, Professor Sir John Curtis, who many people will recognise from our TV screens, an election expert, um, has said uh, effectively is questioning whether Labour have actually sealed the deal yet. Um, and so nothing's guaranteed. Um, and also uh, Ipsos making it clear that just around the challenge for the incumbents and the Conservatives that they... I mean, the, the mountain that they need to climb to steal a phrase from um, Keir Starmer, actually, who's also keen to manage people's expectations in terms of uh, how much effort is required over the next 12 months. But uh, saying the Conservatives need a significant change in the public mood to stay in office. So safe to say both parties still have a lot of work to do, and um, whether that's to in increase their popularity or maintain a lead. Um, so what we might do then is just move on to, like I said, working on the assumption that perhaps Labour could be uh, the next administration. Um, what might their approach to crypto, digital assets, blockchain technology um, be? So I think um, it's safe to say, and we will come on to this in a bit more detail, but it's safe to say that the Labour Party position in relation to these new technologies is still evolving. That's not to say that it's not formed. Um, and obviously we do await their manifesto, which is obviously their chance to set out in detail what their views are. But there is, um, there is stuff to work on, I think, for industry now in terms of some of the, the clues that we're getting from the Labour Party in terms of what they might uh, do if they got into number 10. Um, I think in a general sense, what we know from Labour, um, and we'll look at this in detail in a minute, is that crypto, digital assets, blockchain technology in general, they recognise that it can be harnessed for good. They recognise the potential, which I think is a positive sign for the industry. Um, they seem to recognise the importance of regulation, which is perhaps not surprising for uh, the Labour Party. But they also have set out areas of concern. And I think they've been very clear in some areas around where those concerns lie and maybe what they might seek to address um, as an incoming government. Those things being consumer harm or consumer protection, um, economic crime um, being another one, uh, financial stability, uh, and maybe even the environment. So before we... Uh, throw this big question to you, Gavin, in terms of, okay, what will, uh, what would a Labour government maybe do in terms of their approach? I just wanted to show everybody a few comments that we've pulled from a few key Labour spokespeople. So the first one people might be familiar with is Tulip Sadiq, uh, Labour's Shadow Tre Treasury Minister. Um, that's clearly where most of these policy issues lie. Um, and actually, I think there's some um, some potential uh, to take some positive readings from this. Uh, so she said, cryptocurrency has come a long way since its humble beginnings. 
it has now truly entered the mainstream. So potentially suggesting some acceptance for the fact that these new technologies are here to stay. Um, properly regulated crypto assets have the potential to transform our economy and the financial services sector. Um, many innovative companies are embracing different forms of blockchain technology to improve transparency in finance. It also has the potential to reduce regional inequalities and drive efficiencies in all sorts of industries. So this all sounds very positive. She has said as well, and again, this could evolve, but a Labour government would be serious about attracting fintech companies. And I think crypto and digital assets would like to see themselves as within that. Um, attracting these companies to the UK and safely harnessing their potential. Um, but clearly calls for the need to regulate. And I think this last bit is really interesting for me. The UK does not need to choose between a total crackdown on ownership of cryptocurrencies and the Wild West approach. Properly regulated crypto assets have the potential to transform our economy and the financial services sector. So just to pause there for a minute, Gavin, I mean, that all sounds quite positive. In terms of what a Labour government might normally do as an administration and where they kind of lie in their approach to regulation, etc. What do you think we could expect? And what does that say to you? I mean, what could what could we as industry take from those comments? So um, let me do a job of trying to translate politician language into something that is actionable. Yes, please. Because um, uh, um, uh, my former colleagues have got form in this respect. Um, it's a, a skill set that we all we all carry in and uh, develop while we're in there. Um, really, this is quite a benign set of comments. Um, it's trying to acknowledge that, uh, like any technology, people can use it for good and for bad. The reason why I want to point that out is because uh, I think it's really helpful for understanding actually our policy does get made. So um, while uh, the opposition is the opposition, while you're the shadow treasury minister, not the actual treasury minister, you actually don't have the support of the civil service. Um, you're reliant on fantastic parliamentary researchers, your own access to the Commons Library, briefing notes that are sent through through trade bodies, et cetera, to try and form a view. And what that actually means is, in terms of trying to paint a big picture of what you're trying to do as an administration, you tend to drill down into some kind of key areas, those areas where you've got a clearly defined sense of what you want to change and what you don't. The rest, normally, there's a degree of continuity between different administrations. The other factor that is going on, though, is political parties have a muscle memory. So um, forgive me, because I'm sure everyone on the call will know this already, but just for the sake of pointing out, the Labour Party is a social democratic coalition. It's a party that's emerged in the last 120 years. It has many different strands within it, from trades unions that came together to form it. So things like labour rights and employment rights are really important to it. Um, through um, kind of people that believe that the state has a very activist role to play in people's lives, hence why regulation, consumer protection, and so on become really key. Um, and it has people that believe, by the way, most people believe this, but um, uh, people that are drawn to it, that inequality is a major issue within our society and a set of beliefs about how to do that, whether that's through direct transfer of wealth, through the taxation system, or through investing in public services that can level up in terms of health inequality, et cetera. And so there's a really good uh, kind of idea that came back from actually the last Labour administration that came in. I was speaking to a, um, someone a few months ago who uh, was a shadow minister at that time preparing to go into government. And they would go out on the TV on a Sunday morning or something like that. And even if they hadn't known the story they're going to talk about or they were going to be asked about. They said to me that they knew the answer and they knew it would be consistent with 
what the new Labour project was doing because it had a clear defined set of principles that you could apply almost to any problem. And I think what we're seeing here is something very similar. We're seeing a party that is has its own particular prejudices, its own particular foibles, its own particular desires, and it's trying to apply it to a series of issues, some of which just really aren't going to kind of peak up on people's radar um, unless there's some kind of news story or big scandal. And so what would I what would I say that is, you know, in terms of the emerging kind of picture from the Labour Party, everything that I'm seeing and reading is talking about balancing innovation with regulation. And of course, we've seen the most recent regulatory changes in this area, that they would be supportive and consistent with it. Um, also bear in mind, though, that the other thing that is going on in the other direction is this is a renewed Labour Party from the Labour Party led by Jeremy Corbyn in 2019, which would have led much more on one of those strands, which would have been around markets, regulation, consumer protection, birth is probably where Kisan wants to sit the party right now, which is leaning towards innovation, um, influx of new capital, new startups, um, you know, being pro-business and, and reassuring business um, that actually uh, it's a much closer model to the 97 model than the 2019 model. So I think that's really what's going on in there. I mean, a couple of other things that I think are hot button issues that without segueing in towards the really practical part of this session, um, would be kind of hot buttons that I would want to hit if I was within the crypto industry. Thinking about the applications of crypto and blockchain technologies for serving underrepresented groups, um, remittances, for example, the huge um, uh, kind of diaspora community that um, sits within the wheelhouse of the Labour Coalition, um, humanitarian, interests, you know, the ability to get money to the front lines in places like Ukraine or elsewhere, um, where there are huge humanitarian crises going on. Um, and also people that are unbanked or thin file, people that are, are not served by the existing kind of monopoly players within the banking industry. I think all of those are areas where inevitably the Labour Party can be drawn towards. Um, and a real positive, I think, for the industry to kind of tell a story about. Great, thank you, Gavin. And I think that's really interesting. And before we, so we'll come on to a few other breadcrumbs, if you like, from the Labour Party in a second. Um, but there's a few things that struck me from what you said. And, and one is that actually, if we think about the Labour Party identity historically, um, there are some potential positive areas here that could actually align really nicely to what a Labour Party would want to do in terms of social justice, financial inclusion, the unbanked, international aid. So it strikes me that actually there's an opportunity there for industry to tap in and engage on some of those positives. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about is some of the concerns. So obviously their position is still being developed. It's evolving but i do think we have quite a clear indication of how they might approach this um at the moment so we do also have uh comments around perhaps some of the negative areas or at least some of the negative connotations so uh these are a couple of quotes from labor's shadow exchequer secretary um and again i think it's safe to say but feel free to disagree gavin that the labor party speaks broadly at the leadership level with one voice. So what we're seeing here is actually them all broadly singing from the same hymn sheet. But what um, what we're seeing here are some concerns alongside the recognition of the potential uh, being listed here. So I think there's a few things to take from this. Um, this first one around many crypto investors are unaware of the high risk nature of their investments. Um, and also a serious collapse in crypto could therefore not only wipe out their life savings, but destabilise the UK's financial market. Now, um, sometimes politicians have quite short memories, forgive me for saying that, but sometimes they have long ones as well. And I think what um, what's quite clear here is that even not so recent events like 
the uh, the crash in the crypto market, or slightly more recent events like the the significant failure of the likes of FTX and other big operators, perhaps to a degree, do still taint the view of some politicians, and that also applies to the Labour Party. So these sort of big events are not helpful, and they do remember that, and I think that's one of the things that they're kind of referencing here. Some more recent ones um, here, they've said, also concerning is the rise of crypto-related scams, and also uh, going as far as to say that the UK has become a centre for illicit crypto activity. Now, I know for a fact many people on the call today will take issue with that and actually um, do have quite a robust response when it comes to uh, economic crime issues. I also just wanted to single out here, um, so the Labour Party has also kind of gone into a bit more detail on some other areas, um, the likes of central bank digital currencies or a digital pound. Um, so again, broadly supporting the potential of uh, a digital pound, but also saying that they do have concerns. And this is all quite well documented around things like uh, personal data, privacy, uh, financial stability. And also on some other perhaps more specific areas of the sector, things like NFTs and fan tokens. So um, again, I think a lot of these center around uh, consumer protection concerns. Uh, so comments from Jeff Smith, the uh, Labour's shadow digital minister, within the context of sport though, um, talking about the growth of fan tokens um, and particularly marketing, which is another area of concern for them and making sure that things are, um, or the, the advertising promotion of these sort of assets is um, is regulated and, and properly managed. So that's a good indicator of where they are. One final point I just wanted to pick up from Jeff Smith's comments is, as we mentioned at the very beginning, um, concerned around the environment as well. So, uh, and he goes as far as to say, crypto assets are really bad for the environment. They require huge amounts of power. They are very carbon intensive. That's quite a bold statement from a politician. So before we move on to um, the next section in terms of, well, how can, what, what does this mean for industry and what, what can we do? Um, what would your take be on some of these points where Labour's expressing concerns? I mean, is that something that industry should also be engaging on and, and trying to, to work with politicians to address? Yes, uh, ultimately. Um, I think one thing that's probably important to make clear is just the sheer variety of issues that any member of parliament, any policymaker, has to be across at any given moment. If you looked at my diary as a, even as a relatively junior kind of backbench MP in the last kind of few years of that parliament, there would be 20 to 25 events a day um, that I would need to either have a view on, turn up to, provide remarks at. And so you're really reliant on what is topical. Um, you know, I don't know if anyone's ever watched like question time on a Thursday night. I try and avoid it for the sake of my blood pressure. But, um, you know, whoever is the designated person um, goes through a remarkable process where about 100 thick A4 double sided pages provided by, you know, Conservative Central Office or um, Labour HQ is kind of condensed into someone's brain during the course of the day so that they're prepared for any question. And so what you tend to find is that there's very few issues that politicians don't have a view on, a strongly held view on, but they're also not very deep in terms of uh, how well understood they are. And, um, you know, Lewis, some of the work that um, you've been doing, Crypto UK and others, you know, to engage parliamentarians in Westminster is really, if we're honest, focused around trying to fill in the gaps for them and help them to understand the issues that they are talking about rather than trying to even kind of change minds or persuade because often it's the lack of information that is key um but i do think more positively some of these concerns provide a route in to engage 
So where there are things that are factually just not correct, it's a, it's a great opportunity to reach out and to engage and to say, hey, conventional wisdom might be this, but actually let me share some examples of where that isn't happening. I think also it's important just, just to say that, you know, MPs are representatives, policymakers, ministers are representatives of the public. And therefore, usually what piques someone's interest is a constituency case. It's going to be the MP's post bag. It's going to be high profile stories um, in the news or in the media. And therefore trying to expect that even in the world where there is perfect information and understanding from elected representatives about every particular issue, um, they're still going to be drawn towards um, negativity around the industry because they're going to view it as their role to have a, a view on it, to comment on it, guess what policy needs to be made in response to it. And therefore, there isn't really a choice but to find a route to engage and to try and educate uh, people. Um, you know, I always said as an MP, first time I came to an issue and sat down with someone who actually knew what they were talking about was treat me like an idiot. Just honestly, just go through it really carefully. Brief me. I can ask questions. I can understand. Because asking the right kind of questions is like the core skill set um, for being able to make good policy. Um, I would point out that maybe not every elected politician is famed for this. But the only route through really is to seek to try and engage on the concerns that, um, that, that people have. What are the ones that um, came up in my time? Um, uh, you know, they were again post bag issues, economic crime, fraud, and scams, which, as we know, is not an issue that was um, uh, sadly only prevalent within crypto, but we see it right across financial services um, more broadly. Um, and I do think that is driving a lot of interest um, from elected representatives. Um, I think also regulation. Um, I am FCA regulated um, as the firm that I'm the chief exec of. I carry SMF functions. I understand um, financial promotions. Um, we triggered four different FCA authorizations to get our product to market. Um, I knew that there was some nebulous body called the FCA that was just kind of on top of this stuff. I had no sense of what it did in the way that it operated. How, um, how it functions, how sometimes the best intentions um, of policymakers can run up against the reality of an organisation that is stretched, um, to put it in the most generous sense. And so even bringing those kind of experiences out, um, I think is really helpful. Um, and I think the other thing is just uh, to say, you know, on this call, we've got a remarkable array of subject specialists when it comes to crypto, but um, you know, crypto and digital assets, NFTs, blockchain, all the rest becomes very conflated um, in the minds uh, of most people. And therefore, even the distinctions, the different requirements, the different products that are there, different levels of risk and therefore need for regulation isn't something that's at the forefront um, of most elected representatives. And all I would say is the only way to really do that is to try and build out a relationship, to try and fill in the gaps. Um, and that does go a long way, actually, to um, avoid the kind of incendiary, reactionary um, remarks that politicians can often make in haste and repent of their leisure. Yeah. Really interesting. And actually, in the last 10 minutes, maybe well, quite because we also had quite a few questions on, OK, well, how can what should industry be doing and i think you've kind of touched on that really well there about um they need to engage actually and i um you know i i remember from my time in westminster you know the uh i have i personally have a great deal of sympathy for a lot of um members of parliament because it is a huge job you are as you say across so many issues um and not just one um and so I think it's safe to say that politicians also depend very much on being uh, told and fed information and 
educated and upskilled. And for the most part, um, politicians tend to tend to value that, as you said you did when you were in Westminster as well. In terms of what, I guess, in the last 10 minutes, because given that you have had a foot or actually both feet in Westminster, um, the what is it for you as a member of parliament that really got you interested in things or wanting to engage in particular things? You say that this is a very complex industry, absolutely. But are there any areas where industry could look to try and engage, you know, whether that's articulating the positive use cases, which we've spoken about, engaging on some of the, the negatives uh, or the concerns? Um, but also, you know, we know politicians are always interested in economic benefits, jobs in their local area, perhaps, um, employment opportunities for young people, uh, all those sort of things. I mean, what would be the key things that we could pull out for, for industry? Yeah, great question. So let me answer it in a couple of ways. The, the very top line here is any form of engagement is really valuable. And I also want to just point out it's entirely legitimate, like it's a good thing. Um, this, we're not in a world in which um, there's something kind of mucky or grubby about trying to um, actually inform people that make policy um, with the reality of what's going on, the benefits. And I can guarantee you that every other industry is doing it. Um, just the fact that you know we're sitting on the, the verge of this real kind of um, change in terms of the industry, the emergence of new technologies and so on, the same infrastructure needs to be in place, which is why I know obviously your work, for example, with Crypto UK is so important in terms of that, the all party group um, that, that um, you guys support and so on, just for trying to, to build out those channels. But it can feel quite daunting. And so the other thing I wanted to say is every one of us has got a local MP. If you live in the UK, you have one. Um, what I often used to find is that people in Westminster would want to come to talk to me about hospitality or, I don't know, um, vet care or uh, um, nursery provision. And that's all very interesting from a national angle. But I was the Shadow Minister for International Development uh, or the Shadow Environment Minister or someone that's at the Women Equality Select Committee. Those are the areas that I had to lean into. If someone from my local vet practice called me up and said, do you know what, we'd love you to come in so we talk about the issues and we've got some cute puppies for a nice little photo op, I would have made sure that that was at the top of my diary. <laughs> um, and I, I don't mean that as cynically as it sounds. Those people vote. It is your local, um, you know, all politics is local, as someone once famously said. And it is true, you know, local invitations, local engagement, it doesn't become a reason to say yes, it, you have to have a strong reason to say no because um, reputation is hugely important. So what I'd say is, more than anything else, engagement as early as possible is really helpful. I think it's within the gift of most people to be able to reach out to their own local representatives to say, look, hey, I'd love to come talk to you about what you think about the industry that I'm involved in. Uh, or why don't you come to us? We can arrange for you to see some good stuff and meet some people that are your constituents that work here. Um, I think, you know, the other thing to say as well is it's really easy from the outside to look in and say, politicians, man, they are, are totally kind of well-resourced. They've got the brightest minds of a generation working for them, which they often do, right? They're just not paid as though they are. Um, speaking to anyone that's ever been a parliamentary assistant on the call. Um, but actually, you know, if I'm the shadow minister for Sport and Digital, there might be one person working in my office who is responsible for helping me on the whole policy area that I lead in the Labour Party. On. And they may get invited at very short notice to produce remarks that their minister their employer is going to give in a debate or at a reception or when they go on question time. At that point, being able to scrabble around and say, actually, I've read a really good report on this. I've seen the recommendations. It seems in line with what we were doing. You know, that is really valuable. And so it's both on the policy side, but it's on the human side as well. You know, I would be encouraging 
given where we are, who knows the election the next 15 months. It's rare that you've got this level of kind of confidence around which party is most likely to be in government and where it's relatively settled in terms of who the ministerial roles are and so on. I'd be encouraging people to engage through whatever route they could with their locally represented, uh, you know, engaged representatives, whether that's their local MPs, the appropriate shadow minister and so on, because without that, the, the understanding just won't be there. Yeah, great. Well, in the last uh, minute or so, um, I'm going to ask you what is your one kind of um, parting recommendation or suggestion that you would want to leave with industry today? We've covered a lot, you know, um, when when the election might be, uh, who might be the next uh, government, what a Labour government might do in terms of crypto and digital assets and blockchain. And also some really helpful thoughts from you there, Gavin, in terms of what industry can do now to engage. Um, I guess if I were to ask you to summarise, what is that one thing that you would want to really leave with all of us on the call today? Uh, what would that be? Um, I think I made the point around engagement pretty clear. Um, but I suppose it would be don't leave it to someone else. So for all of us, you know, we like to live in a world in which we think uh, someone somewhere is making sure that this news gets through. You know, when we see something on the news about crypto and it's overwhelmingly negative, but also inaccurate, we think someone somewhere is going to intervene and say, that's not right, let me correct the record. And the problem with that, of course, is that someone somewhere isn't always there, but you are. I think that for everyone on this call, they should be genuinely, when they go through their risk register, be thinking about political risk and um, engaging not just with the obvious suspects, but also more broadly across the political system, I think is really wise. I was struck by the, um, uh, you know, the, the story of some journalists that I knew who in 2009 couldn't la- name a single Lib Dem. Uh, you know, as a contact or a source that they would pick up the phone to. And in 2010, these guys were running different ministries within the government uh, and had to kind of build it out. So it's not just the Labour team, but it's whoever is local. You can't predict in the current environment exactly what's going to happen. But I would say engage, engage early. Um, Use the support of uh, people um, that know how to do this. Um, Often a bit of common sense goes a long way, but also a bit of specialist advice can be really helpful. And I know obviously um, through Crypto UK and and, uh, the work of Emergence, there's the possibility to do that. Um, But more than anything, I would say get out there. You know, in every other area of our businesses, we are probably the first people to say, it's not done from behind a desk, time kills deals. Let's get out and really engage with what we need to do. I would just encourage people to treat politics in exactly the same way. It's a key part of the environment in which people are building their businesses and therefore they need to engage. Great. Well, uh, that's fantastic. Thank you, Gavin. Your your parting thoughts, engage, engage early, get out there. Really helpful message and I think an interesting one to to finish on. Um, We'll draw to a close there, but Gavin, I just want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you, everyone else, for joining us. Uh, We've covered a lot, but hopefully uh, that was uh, useful and food for thought. So thank you, Gavin, and thank you, everyone else, and have a good rest of your afternoon.